So, by the way, so I say that to say, I wrote this message about three weeks ago, knowing that we were going to be out of town, but it seems appropriate for all of us, given what I just discussed. And that was the Lord laid on my heart to give a message of comforting his people. Okay. I want to talk about biblical comfort, God's divine command to bring comfort to his people. Okay. So any, any cor uh, correlation or coincidence here is entirely on God, not on me, but we are going to talk about our glorious God or taking comfort in the glorious God of heaven. All right, so I want you to turn, if you will, to Isaiah chapter 6, well-known verse, talking about the throne room of God. Okay. And so as, we, as you turn there, this, here's what I want to say. God greatly desires to comfort his people. He wants to comfort us, but we have some things to do if we want to receive that comfort. Okay. If we're resisting what God is doing, it's more difficult for God to give us comfort. If we have a too low of a view of God and his holiness and his perfection and his power and his authority, we are not going to be recipients of the true comfort he wants to offer to us. Okay. And so the first point that you'll see here is taking comfort because God is on his throne now, let's not minimize the truth that God is on his throne. There's incredible power, the throne room of the universe. All of things that are created, both visible and invisible, are in God's control, in God's hand. He is in control of everything. And when our life seems to be spinning out of control, isn't it awesome to know that we have a God who's fully in control? And he wants us to put our trust and our hope and our comfort in him. And so I think seeing him sitting on his throne, especially in times where we are desperate to receive comfort from him, is a great vision that we should all have. So let's take a look here in Isaiah 6, starting in verse 1. Okay. Isaiah writes this, In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne, high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple, and above it stood seraphim. Each one had six wings, and with two he covered his face, and two he covered his feet, and with two he flew. And one cried to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is Yahweh of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the doorposts, oh, I'm sorry, the posts of the door were shaken by the voice of him who cried out, and the house was filled with smoke. And so I said, woe to me, for I am undone, because I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Okay. Now, well, let me go on. So then one of the seraphim flew to me, having, having a coal in his hand, a live coal which he had taken with the tongs from the altar, and he touched my mouth with it and said, Behold, this has touched your lips. Your iniquity is taken away and your sin is purged. And then he goes on. So there's a, one of the better pictures. You can go to Revelation chapter 4, chapter 5, and see more pictures of the throne room of God. You can go to Ezekiel. There's other places where the throne room is described. But this is a glorious one and probably one that sounds awfully familiar to you. So in your notes, I just want to point out a couple of things that I think are really relevant to receiving God's comfort because he is a God entrenched on his throne. He is established on his throne. Okay? So even what we see here is even in the highest parts of heaven, even surrounded by angels and other created beings who have never experienced sin because they wouldn't be in the God's throne room if they'd experienced sin. We're talking about perfect angels created, even in the midst of all of this, he is high and lifted up. So in our mind, we go, well, here we are on earth and heaven is way above us and way above us in heaven, God is on his throne and still even higher yet, God is glorious. Okay. Even in the greatest presence of everything, the absence of sin and the presence of perfection, God is still incredibly high. So high, it's hard to describe it with words, okay? We're talking about an immensely glorious God. 
And he's so immense, in fact, that word kind of means beyond our comprehension. Our minds can, can't even comprehend how glorious and how exalted God is. Okay? That's what Isaiah is trying to communicate to us in words that, that fail to really be able to tell us the story. But we see that in this picture, even the train of his robe, the very lowest part of the clothing that he wears as he's seated on, seated on the throne, fills the whole temple with his glory. Imagine just looking up. That, you know, we haven't even seen his feet. You know, if we put an anthropomorphized version of God, we, we see his feet are looking all the way up. Just the train of his robe is enough to fill the whole temple with God's glory. This is an incredible vision. That again, when we get there, when we see him, we are going to be so beyond whatever we ever thought we might think God is glorious in and what that picture of the throne room of God is. Be expecting to have no ability in, this, in your current ability to comprehend what's going on. We're going to be given a new glorified body and more kinds of ability to, to perceive him. But even in that, look at this. Okay? The seraphim stood above the temple in reverence to God and his holiness. And these angels who are perfect, okay, meaning God created them without sin, and they didn't fall with Satan into sin, they recognize his holiness so much that they cover their feet before his presence. And they cover their eyes before his presence because even in that state of perfection, he is so glorious that even sinless beings have a difficult time perceiving him and, and, and recognizing their own faults in their own creation. And so they're covering their feet because feet can be a little dirty and nasty even in that realm. And they're covering their eyes because they're like, I can't take in all the glory of God. Do you see that picture? Why is that important in this? Because that's a God who's so holy, so glorious, so powerful, but he wants to bring comfort to us. There's a lot of power. There's a lot of imagery there that he wants us to take hold of. And we see this again as another seraph, one of the seraphim, so one seraph cries out to another, holy, holy, holy. Get that phrase in your mind. That's what we're going to be singing and proclaiming throughout eternity. If we're a believer in Christ, we're going to constantly be saying, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. Not because he keeps going, come on, you haven't said it in a while. I need you to say it again. It's because our hearts are going to look at him again and say, oh, he is so holy. And we are just going to proclaim it as a natural response because that's what we're seeing and we are proclaiming his glory. Okay? This is a glorious God, a glorious vision that we get exposed to here in Isaiah. And the cry went out. And so as the cry goes out of how holy God is in the perfect temple of God, the throne room of God, the doorposts are shaking because of his glory. Can you imagine how powerful and how glorious that throne room is as we cry out to how holy he is, the building itself is shaking. Why? Because he's that glorious, because he's that powerful, because he's that magnificent in every way, every respect. Our God is so incredibly glorious and full of glory. And then Isaiah, so here's Isaiah, he gets this response. We see a couple of people in scripture have this experience where they walk in or somehow get an opportunity to see God a little bit more closely than you and I do, okay? Paul and John and Isaiah, Daniel chapter 10, and they just, they just can't even believe it. So Isaiah is here, he gets called up spiritually into the throne room of God, some kind of vision, and his first thought is, I'm a man of unclean lips, Forget all the other sins. I have failed to praise the creator of the universe with my lips as often and as powerfully as I should have. I should have been spending so many of my days saying, God, your glory is holy. You are holy. And he's, like, he's looking at himself and saying, yeah, I did this and did that and all, did all these other sins. But what is my greatest sin in seeing God in his presence is I failed in so many ways to declare with my lips his glory. 
And he could have been doing that all of his life. And he sees missed opportunity after missed opportunity of not giving God glory due to his name. Okay. So he sees that his lips should be, they were created to praise God. His, my lips, your lips, Isaiah's lips were created to praise God. And what are we using our lips for? In many ways, not, not blessing God, but doing other things. And so I want to use these lips to proclaim the glory of God. But what have my lips spoken? Nasty, horrible, sinful words. And how am I going to praise God with the same mouth that I do these other atrocious things with? So what, is, what, what happens in the story? He needs cleansing. He needs his lips cleansed purely, perfectly, so that he can declare the glory of God. Okay? And that's exactly what happens. An alt, a coal from the altar is taken, and that altar, if we were to jump into Hebrews and take a look at that altar, is the eternal altar in heaven. Jesus Christ's blood, even though this is 700 years before Christ was born, Jesus Christ's blood was taken on that figurative altar, and his, that coal from the altar then cleansed his lips purely, perfectly, so that he could do that which he was created to do. Praise God with his mouth, praise God with his heart, and with pure and undefiled lips, which can only be done if Christ himself cleanses this nasty thing that I use, that James talks about, the untamable tongue, right? And he cleanses me so that when you and I stand in his presence, we can actually spend eternity proclaiming his glory, proclaiming his goodness. So that's a powerful vision of something we'll, we, will, we should absolutely expect to see and experience when we get up there, when we perish from this life and enter into eternity. Okay. But this is all, to me right now, in the category of God wanting to comfort his people. So think about Isaiah. The moment Isaiah encounters the perfect living God, he recognizes I'm sinful. I don't belong here. There's a problem. He's too glorious. I'm too sinful. I don't belong here. And God steps in and solves his problem for him. He brings cleansing. He brings healing. He brings all that God needs for him so that the one that God loves, Isaiah, can then stand before him pure, purified in every way, declaring the glory of God. That should bring us comfort. So yes, we're all sinners saved by grace and we all need to be cleansed. But we should take every opportunity we have to cry out, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. And try to put away from our lips the unclean things and put the holiness of God in our hearts in our minds, in our lips. So from that, if you're in Isaiah, jump forward to chapter 40. Chap the whole chapter here is fantastic, but I'll just, I want to read the first verse and then um, 18 through 31. Isaiah is such a fantastic book, as they all are, but... Isaiah 40, verse 1, God cries out. In fact, it's a command. Comfort, yes, comfort my people, says your God. God is commanding comfort for his people. Okay, And I'm going to go through, he's going to talk about some various things here. But to get to the point, so what is he asking? How is he commanding the, the universe, commanding the holy host of heaven? How is he commanding here, Isaiah, to comfort his people? will jump forward and he wants to reveal the truth to us about who he is so that we know where the comfort we desire comes from. So starting in verse 18, same chapter, verse 40, he writes, to whom will you liken God or what, what likeness will you compare to him? The workman molds an image, the goldsmith overspreads it with gold the, and the silversmith cast with silver and chains. These are not good things. Who, uh, whoever is too impoverished for such a contribution chooses, chooses a tree that will not rot. He sees for himself a skillful workman to prepare a carved image that will not totter. That's not a good thing. So here's God's response. Have you not known? 
Have you not heard? Have it not been told to you from the very beginning? Have you not understood from the foundations of the earth? It is he who sits above the circle of the earth. And the inhabitants are like grasshoppers to him, who stretches out the heavens like a curtain and spreads them out like a tent to dwell in. Oh, boy, there's so much science there we could jump into, but we won't. Okay. He brings the princes to nothing. He makes the judges of the earth useless. Scarcely shall they be planted. Scarcely they shall be sown. Scarcely shall their stock take root in the earth. And when he also will blow on them, they will wither. And the whirlwind will take them away like stubble. That's not a good thing. Putting our trust in earthly things rather than the divine heavenly things is not good. So he goes on. Well, then to whom will you liken me? Or to whom shall I be be equal, says the Holy One? Lift up your eyes on high and see who created these things, who brings out their host by number and calls them all by name, by the greatness of his might and the strength of his power, not one of them is missing. Why do you say, O Jacob, and speak, O Israel, my way is hidden from the Lord, and my claim is passed over by my God? Have you not known? Have you not heard? The everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth, he neither faints nor is weary. His understanding is unsearchable. He gives power to the weak, and to those who have no might, he increases strength. Even the youths shall faint and be weary, and the young men shall utterly fall. But those who wait for on the Lord shall renew their strength and they shall mount up with wings like eagles and they shall run and not be weary and they shall walk and not faint. I love chapter 40. (laughs) If we put our trust in idols of gold and silver and wood or we put our trust in the things we plant in the ground or the things that fall into our bank account, We are putting our trust in something that is guaranteed to fail and will not result in the comfort from the living God. But when we are weak, he brings us strength. When we are discouraged, he brings us hope. When we are downtrodden, he is our champion and the one who brings us victory. We have to see the things of this world will always fail. They will always falter, and the things of heaven will always prosper, will always be a blessing that God desires to give to us. And so he can't comfort us if we are putting our trust in things that aren't from him. Do you get the message? We can't have the hope and the comfort that God wants from us if I have one thing in my life that I'm trusting more than him. Because suddenly I'm trusting that and my hope is in this, whatever it may be, rather than trusting in the living God. Has he made himself known? Has he made himself clear? Has it not been known from the creation of the world how powerful he is? And that's the God who wants to bring comfort to us. Our hearts, our minds, our spirits. He wants to comfort us. But you see, there is a barrier to his ability to comfort us, and it's within us as we idolize anything higher, stronger, more powerful than God himself. We have to release all of that so we can be comforted by our creator. So we see all these things. So, and you can just walk through your notes here fairly quickly. God speaks and assures his people that He is offering the true comfort that only he can give. Nothing else in the created universe can give that comfort. God and his ability to bring comfort cannot be compared to anything else. We just went through that. Nothing else can comfort. Nothing but God can. Okay. Let her see God and the God, the everlasting creator never faints. He never grows weary. He's never too tired of offering his comfort to us. He always wants to bring us comfort under the condition that we put no other God before him. He alone is God, and he's the one in charge. God's glorious wisdom is unsearchable and beyond all human wisdom and intellect. 
Boy, that was on full display at the Creation Museum. Okay, just, you know, I, I can't talk about it because there's not enough time. But on full display, the wisdom of God is so much more powerful, so much more accurate, so much more wonderful than the wisdom of man. Okay? In all of these things, in all of these hypotheses, all of these things that talk about the existence of anything, God's wisdom is far superior in every way. In fact, we've also been talking about that in our First Corinthians study, because the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. And if we don't accept the cross, we're not going to accept the rest of God's wisdom either. Right? That's just the way it is. And so God's wisdom is incredible, and we have to trust in his wisdom. He knows how to bring us comfort. I don't know how to bring you comfort. I don't know how to bring myself comfort. God is the one who needs to bring all comfort to those who are seeking him. Don't trust in chariots and horses. Don't trust in pastors or kings. Trust in the Savior, Jesus Christ who is seated on the right hand of the Father in heaven. That's who we trust in in all of these troubled times that we deal with. It's still 2021, right? We still have lots of problems in our world that we're dealing with. So how do you make that transition? How do you make the transition from, okay, I see what Isaiah saw, and I see that God is calling me to have no other gods before him, have no other idols, no other forms of worship, have no, have no attachment to the things of this world if they separate me from putting God on the throne where he belongs, in my heart, in my mind, in my life. Okay? How do I get there? Well, I'm going to suggest we get there, we get God's comfort, we, we, we fall into that area of God's comfort when we do what we've been doing here in worship, and that's praising God. The more we identify opportunities to praise our God, the more all other things of this world will fall into the proper perspective. Okay? We need to praise God. That's the ultimate true solution to getting rid of the false idols and the false gods in our life. And that's to simply have a life of praising God. Okay? So in... Uh, Psalms, I have Psalm 33 listed. We won't have time for that this morning. But I want look at Psalm 148 and 150. Here is your antidote. Here are the things that you can do personally to make sure you are right where God wants you to be because he wants to bring you comfort. He wants to bring me comfort. He wants to bring all of us comfort. How do we get there? Praise the Lord. So Psalm 148, there's many, many other psalms I could choose from, but I just pick these two, okay? Praise the Lord. Here's our response. Praise the Lord. He is worthy, right? Praise the Lord from the heavens. Praise him in the heights. Praise him, all his angels. Praise him, all the host. Praise him, sun. Praise him, all you stars of light. Praise him, you heavens of heavens and you waters above the heavens. Let them praise the name of the Lord. So all these things, he just, just called out all of these false gods, if you will, right? The, the sun and the moon, the stars and the angels and all these things that people worship sometimes and they shouldn't. The command here is let them praise God too, okay? And then we see, let them, verse 5, let them praise the name of the Lord, which is actually Yahweh. So praise Yahweh. Okay? For he commanded, and all these things were created, amen, hallelujah, and he also established them forever and ever. He made a decree which shall not pass away. Praise the Lord from the earth, you great sea creatures. And he's going to go on and talk about how every single thing we observe in this universe has been created by a single deity, God himself. And they are all, we can either worship and serve them, which is bad, or we can recognize that every one of them, like us, was created to worship God in heaven. Okay, so look at Psalm 150. This will drive that point further home for us. Praise the Lord. Praise God in his sanctuary. We just saw Isaiah doing that very thing. Praise him in his mighty firmament. Praise him for his mighty acts. Praise him according to his excellent greatness. Praise him with the sound of the trumpet. Praise him with the lute and the harp. Praise him with the tremble and the dance. Praise him with stringed instruments and flutes. Praise him with loud cymbals. Praise him with clashing cymbals. Oh, worship should be crashing loud praise, honor of God. 
Okay? We need to praise him in every way. Okay? Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Are you breathing? You can praise the Lord. Okay? Is, 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 are, is everything in the animal kingdom breathing? It should praise the Lord. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. That's the best outcome we can ever hope for. And that's what really and truly brings us comfort. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. All right, well, one last thing here, and we're, we're going to look at Psalm 145. I'm not going to go there. We're just going to, like sit, finish up here. But recognize Scripture teaches, and you can look at Psalm 145 if you like, but he is righteous and he is gracious. Our Lord is righteous. He never compromises on truth. He never compromises on his righteousness. But he's also gracious. He recognizes you and I have sin problems. You and I have issues in our life, and he wants to be gracious to us for our problems, for our faults, for our transgressions, everything that we do. But we have to receive from him the truth and the blessing and let that coal from the altar come and touch our sins so that we can be in his presence. So he fulfills, or so he's, he's near. So that Psalm 45, 145 talks about he's near to all those who call upon him. Are you calling upon the Lord? Are you calling upon him in spirit and in truth? Are you calling upon him because he is great and greatly to be praised? Well, then you should expect that he hears and he responds and he gives you according to his will, whatever blessing that might be. And we should not prejudice and say, well, if he does this, then I know he's God and I know that I'm being blessed. And if he doesn't do this, then I'm holding it against him. No, we need to surrender to him and bring our cares to him, call upon him, and he will fulfill according to his desire what he desires to bring as a blessing. He fulfills the desires of those who fear him. So fear him obviously means we put, we put him above us. We put his needs above my needs. Not that God has needs, but he has a will and he has a purpose. And so we put him above me. And then when he tells me what I should desire through prayer, then he fulfills it. He shows himself strong and fulfills what he wants to give to me. Hopefully not what I want that he doesn't want for me because that would be bad. Because he only wants good things for me. And I can't often figure it out. So I want things for me and he doesn't want, because he wants better things for me than I want for myself. I just have to hear him to receive it. He will save all those who call upon him. This is a great message. Are you here and do you know the Lord? If you don't, I'm here to tell you this morning, if you call upon his name and seek salvation in the only Son of God, Jesus Christ, and the blood he shed on the cross, he has guaranteed he will save you in eternity. If, that, if you're not there, don't leave today without making a decision for Christ. Okay? This is a day that God greatly desires to bring you into the kingdom of God. All who call upon his name will be saved. That's a promise. That's a comfort. That is a guarantee from the creator who built every cell in your body. He desires to save you. So come and make a confession of faith this morning. And he preserves those who love him. If we love him, he will preserve us according to his purposes, according to his will. This message is designed to bring comfort to the body. Isaiah 40, verse 1 says, comfort my people. Yes, comfort them. I'm trying to help us all grasp what that means. Okay? It means trusting in the truth of who God is. It means getting rid of all false idols and things that we put in our life that are above God. It means transitioning from praising man and praising myself to praising my creator and putting all other things in their proper perspective. And it means coming to him and making my request known and let his will be done because I know he's powerful, I know he's strong, and I know he wants to bring comfort to me. I just have to get out of the way and praise him in the valleys and praise him on the mountaintops and praise him everywhere in between. I praise him he responds as a good and loving and perfect God of all comfort and all peace.
Okay. So that's our message this morning. Okay. So let's pray. Oh, Father God, we desperately need your comfort. In every season of our life, we need, Lord, to put you on the throne of our hearts and our minds and have a sense of your power and your perspective of life, Lord God. Let us not have any other idols that are between God and man, but let us have you, Lord God, as our only source of truth, our only source of praise and worship, and we cast aside all other things, Lord God, that you desire to remove from our minds, remove from our hearts, and remove from our lives, and we just want to submit them at the foot of the cross and say, Jesus, I want you. Jesus, nothing else will ever do. And we thank you for that, Lord God. And we just ask your blessings upon this church and your blessings upon every individual who's here in the name and the power and authority of Jesus Christ. And it's in your name that we pray. Amen. All right. So we'll have prayer teams up front. Genuinely, if you make, want to make a decision for Christ or talk to me about it, please come forward. I want to make sure that your salvation is in Christ this morning if you're willing to receive it. Hallelujah. We have refreshments and fellowship time. It's not in the park, but we can still enjoy some time together this morning. So.